صباح الخير اهلا وسهلا فيكم عن جديد ان شاء الله تكونوا استمتعتوا بحفله بكره بحفله بكره هل لساتني متاثره بحفله امبارح ان شاء الله تكونوا استمتعتوا بحفله امبارح واكيد السهرات مستمره اليوم وبكره بس قبل ما نبلش بدي انوه بس على شغله انه لكل الحضور الكرام اي حدا رح يحضر الحفلات تاعت بكره واليوم آه لازم يكون معاه الباج اذر ذان ذات صعب انه يدخل لانه كان في اعداد يمكن زياده امبارح فبعد اذنكم انه تكون الباج معكم فاذا آه برجع بقول لكم اهلا وسهلا فيكم بالمؤتمر الدولي الثامن للتامين اكبر كونفرنس 2022 والذي يقام بدورته الثامنة تحت رعاية عطوفة رئيس مجلس هيئة مفوضي سلطة منطقة العقبة الاقتصادية الخاصة اليوم رح يكون في فور سيشنز أول جلسة وثاني جلسة الحضور الكرام موجودين معنا التوبيك الأول رح يكون يعني آه بس قبل كمان ما نبلش فيهم أي حدا رح تكون كله بالإنجليزي فأي حدا بده ديفايس بيقدر ياخده من الانترنس عشان يعني ما تتغلبوا التوبيك الأول non damage business interruption cover how insurers uh, reinsure and reinsurers are dealing with pandemics epi uh, and epidemics. التوبيك uh, الثاني impact of uh, pandemics epid uh, epidemics on D and O insurance. The speakers uh, will head of sessions موجودين معنا. The speaker Mr. Basim Haddadin, the first topic, will head of session Mr. Manzoor Andrabi. Uh, the second session, uh, Mrs. The speaker Mrs. Shalita, uh, Christina Shalita, Vice President, and uh, NASCO Re France. أنا رح أترك الانترودكشن عن كل سبيكر للهيد اوف سيشن والتوبيك الثاني الهيد اوف سيشن مستر رائد خليل حدادين أهلا وسهلا فيكم رح أترك الكلمة للهيد اوف سيشن والسبيكر للجلسة الأولى مستر منظور Good morning, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of Akaba Conference to afford me this opportunity to be present here and to head this session. Uh, I am, my name is Manzoor Andrabi. I am uh, the country manager for Cunningham, Lindsay, Saudi Arabia, and which is going to be, part, we are part of Sajwik, the global organization in Sajwik. And uh, it's going to be Sajwik Saudi Arabia soon. So uh, today I am uh, honored to present Mr. Basim Hadadin, who will uh, discuss a very interesting topic uh, about uh, non-damage business interruption insurance. 
and uh, especially he will discuss the uh, dealings of insurance claims by insurers and reinsurers for the pandemics and the epidemics like COVID-19. So uh, with a big hand from yourselves, you I present you Mr. Basim Hadadin. Good morning all, and thank you for being here in this session and the sessions after to talk about non-damage business interruption. And uh, I will take COVID-19 as a good example uh, about the trigger of this cover. But of course, this is a, not a new cover, although uh, we've been hearing, hearing about it for the past two years uh, because of the situation, of course. So I will be discussing, I will take in COVID-19 as a good example. However, the cover is, was there, always been there for um, other risks such as, you know, business interruption following terrorist attacks or cyber attacks or what we call the wide area damages such as floods and earthquakes that really affect the uh, areas uh, other than the area that is insured, uh, uh, the business insured itself. So, I'll get you back in time. If you have forgotten, it was uh, New Year's Eve 2019, and uh, the Chinese government reported a cluster of pneumonia uh, cases in Wuhan, China. And days later, the, it was determined that this is a new virus, and they called it SARS-CoV-2, and the virus began to spread. Uh, it went all over the world, infecting more than 460 million people, confirmed individuals in at least 219 countries, and resulting in more than 6 million deaths as of early May 2022. That is if you believe that the, the virus exists, because some they don't believe it is. So, so what happened is that uh, small businesses in particular, they were affected. Uh, it was estimated, estimated that 400 billion US dollars per month were lost due to the government shutdowns. <coughs> and it is estimated that the global business interruption premiums are only 40 billion, which makes the industry bankrupt. And this is a rough figure because the business interruption itself uh, uh, insurers are not required to report it on a separate line. So this is a rough figure. We are talking about 40 billion estimated losses that the b businesses have. So when businesses uh, requested reimbursement to their losses, the insurance denied their claims, basing it that pandemics are not covered under business interruption following material damage. I'm talking here about business interruption, the standard business interruption following material damage, and the claims were denied. By June 2020, the insurance industry denial of coverage called COVID-19 business interruption losses has generated as many as 30 million potential business interruption claims. I know not all of you here come from a property insurance background, so I'll quickly you know, try to uh, tell you what is the cover for business interruption, the standard business interruption following material damage. VBI insurance protects uh, business income stream when its operations are shut down by a covered peril, leading to decline in revenues and increase in expenses or both. And the, of course, the purpose of the BI insurance is to return the policyholder to the, to the position it was, it had been occupied before the covered peril had, had occurred. Typically, the BI insurance, it comes as a part of it's a section, separate section under the all risk uh, policy, the property insurance all risk policy, and we do not really see it on a standalone basis. It's always as a section under the property or risk. Now, how the problem started? The BI wordings, uh, 
like many other lines of business, they vary from insurer to insurer. However, all BI policies are drafted by insurers, and thus it's always sold as take it or leave it basis. The insurer does not have a big say in it. Insurers, of course, because they have drafted the policy, they insisted that the BI claims stemming from COVID-19, they are not covered under the BI policy. And of course, the, insu the insurers, the businesses, along with their lawyers, say no, the wording does really uh, cover the COVID-19 damages and the business interruption triggered out of it. And another issue that, you know, made this problem more that we know that in the insurance industry because uh, most of the time the businesses they buy the, the cover with the expectations without really reading the, the wordings in deep but they know that they bought the business interruption on an all risk basis so that should be you know should be co covered all the risks and that of course uh, including the business interruption but we know this is not always true in our industry. So, the, regardless of the wording used for business interruption, I'm taking this from the LM7 as an example, but the wordings are always very similar. There is what we call the material damage proviso. It's a provision in the policy that says that in order to trigger the loss, there should be a direct physical loss or damage indemnifiable under section one of the policy, which is the material damage. This provision, is always there, it's in the beginning of the policy, and it talks about a direct physical loss or damage. However, we know that the phrase direct physical loss or damage is not defined anywhere in the policy. There is no definition in the policy what is a direct physical loss of, of the, uh, physical loss or damage of the property itself. Uh, and there is really no basis in the policy language to conclude that tangible physical damage is required in order to trigger the cover. So as it is not defined anywhere in the policy, courts usually interpret the term physical damage to mean distinct, demonstrable, physical alteration of the property. So by using the definition of physical damage, it, it would appear that there is really no cover to virus-related losses, and the loss did not result in the physical alteration of the property. This created, of course, difficulties of proof for many businesses, since it's not easy for the insurers to really uh, prove that there is a physical damage to that property insured. Accordingly, the loss of use or loss access to property would not trigger such cover. And this is, that was ascertained by an English court case, the TTC London versus Alliance Insurance, where this was, that was a coffee shop. And the court said, no, the, the, the closure of the coffee shop due to COVID-19 did not constitute material damage, and as such, they cannot really ask for indemnity from their insurers. This caused problems to the insurers themselves as well, because courts, Usually, when there is ambiguity in language, they rule to, in the favor of the insureds. The problem gets more complicated when we see that many courts actually did rule that physical alteration of the property is not necessary to show physical damage occurred. And the famous case of Gregory Packaging Incorporation versus Travelers Property Gauge Company of America. There was a accidental release of ammonia in, the, in this factory. And the courts did uh, actually rule that the release of ammonia did constitute direct physical loss or damage to the property. So there is a confusion here in the court rulings. So the insureds, the businesses, uh, they believe, according to the wordings that they have, that there are certain clauses, mainly the denial of access, the suppliers and, extension, and customers extension clause, and the contamination provision 
in the policy really provides cover for such risks. So I'll take them one by one. Denial of access. The cover says that denial of access resulting from interruption of it or interference with the business or consequence of damage in, consequ in consequence of damage to property in the vicinity of the premises, etc., etc., is covered. Now, the word damage is not defined anywhere in the policy, not in this uh, clause itself. So the insurers say, well, we have damages resulting from whatever, in this case it's COVID-19, that, that's why it should be covered, because we are not able, there is a denial of access to, the, to our property, our employees cannot can in, come in, or the customers cannot come in, so we have denial of access, and insurers should pay. The second uh, extension is the suppliers and customers extension, which says that we, the insurers, we will pay for the actual loss of business income you sustain due to physical loss or damage at the premises of a dependent party, a third party, caused by or resulting from any covered cause of loss. Again, physical loss or damage is not defined. Thus, any damages to the customers or suppliers' property that affect my business should be covered because there was a damage. The third extension is the contamination provision, which says if your operations are suspended due to contamination, then we, the insurers, will pay for the actual loss of business income you sustain caused by a contamination that results in an action by a public or health, public health or other governmental authority that prohibits access to the police soldiers, etc., etc. In this case, we don't have a definition, we don't need a definition for physical loss or damage like the denial of access and the supplier's extension, but here they are talking about a dangerous condition. And the insurers say, well, this is a dangerous, dangerous condition. Uh, COVID is very dangerous. Uh, we are not able to do our business as we, we had to, so uh, this, is, this cover should uh, you know, give us the, 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 the purpose to, to uh, ask the, the insurance company to, for, for a uh, indemnity. The insurers are smart as well. We have uh, two good exclusions that are almost there in every BI policy, business interruption policy. And the two main, main ones are the uh, communicable disease uh, uh, exclusion, what is, we call it the virus exclusion, and we have the pollution exclusion. <coughs> the communicable disease exclusion says we, the insurers, we will not pay for loss or damage resulting from any virus bacterium or other microorganism that include that that induces or is capable of inducing physical distress illness or disease etc this ex this exclusion refers to the sars at the time the covid-19 was not there yet but we have this exclusion for the sars virus and the insurers say okay it was for sars but you know a virus is a virus and it's always evolving and this should also uh, exclude damages arising out of COVID-19. And of course, now with this, we have new versions of this, uh, this uh, exclusion that really exclude all kinds of viruses and their mutations, of, including, of course, the COVID-19. The pollution exclusion, it says that we will not pay for loss or damage caused by or resulting from the discharge, dispersal, seepage, migration, release, or escape of pollutants. And the pollutants is defined as any solid, liquid, gases, or thermal irritant, or contaminant, including smoke, vapor, soot, fumes, acids, alkalides, chemicals, and waste. And of course, according to insurers, this should cover viruses. So viruses are excluded. We can see that insurers uh, they use certain defense to avoid or limit the payment of these claims. I'm talking about business interruption following material damage. Still, I'm talking about material damage. First day, there's always an explicit exclusion in the wording. These exclusions, they either come on a standalone basis or be incorporated in other exclusions, such as the pollution and contaminated exclusions. So, so th these are explicit exclusions in the policy to deny payments. 
Also, insurers, they have, they always use sublimits or waiting periods. This, of course, can limit the indemnity amount and uh, for a good excuse. So if you have an employee who is diagnosed with coronavirus and comes to work and he exposes others, employees are quarantined, the entire office or plant might have to be shut down, resulting in loss of income. This, of course, can be covered. It is covered. However, there is always a sublimit that makes the you know, indemnity for the businesses, for the insurers, are really not that important and not you know, taking the, to, to compare it with the actual loss that they had. A third way that insurers avoid payment is by, uh, even if they admitted that coronavirus is a property damage, still they have time element coverage that ensure that only the period needed to repair the damage is enough for the, for the uh, indemnity. So let's say if we have oh, insurers, they argue that the virus exists for only a short period of time in the air on the surface. So all it needs is a little bit of cleaning and they, thus they limit the indemnity period for the cleaning amount which is really, you know, it's a ridiculous amount of, you know, it's an hour, so it will get before the, below the deductible last one. So, the non-damage business interruption was later introduced into the policies, and these are really to cover non-core business interruption risks resulting from uh, events that may, be, may not produce physical damage to the uh, insured property. And of course, these are what we call black swan events. We are characterized by low frequency and high severity that can lead to serious disruption of earnings to the insured. So did we solve the problem of the business interruption following material damage? Actually, not really. Uh, the BI following non-damage, it is uh, always tailored for a specific risks only, meaning that if you buy business, business interruption following viruses, then it cannot, comp it cannot cover you if you had a loss, uh, say, by flood. So it's not an all-risk policy. It is always specific for a certain risk, risk such as terrorist attack, viruses in our case, or similar things. So it's not an all-risk policy. It's only a very small extension, sub-extension to the business interruption section of the policy. So again, we have disputed arguments between the insured and the insurers as well. And they rely, they rely on three main uh, uh, clauses in the policy, the denial of access, and the disease clauses and the trends clauses. The denial of access or prevention of access clause says that the clause it provides cover for interruption to a business where there has been an order by a public authority that prevents the use of the insured premises. So there's, there has to be an order by a governmental or authority to stop uh, to deny people coming into the premises of the insured. However, to, for these clauses to, to be triggered, there has to be certain elements to, to satisfy the requirement of this clause. One, there has to be the force of law. So, how do we deal with government advisory restrictions? Are these are uh, forced by law? Because not always the, it, it was not always that the, the, uh, there was you know new laws were put to prevent people going out or in. Before that, we had people. It was only advisory statements from the government. So, uh, can we say that this can trigger a denial of access because it was only advisory? It was not ordered by ordered by an authority of you know, the governmental authorities. Two, there should be an inability to use. And the argument goes that, are we talking about partial inability of the premises, 
uh, on partial inability to use the premises. Say we have, we have a hotel which is allowed to remain open but the restaurants are closed. Or a coffee shop that uh, dining in is not allowed but takeaway is still okay. So is that, can, can we consider that to be a denial of access? Can we trigger the denial of access according to this? The third argument is about the interruption. Do we need to have a full interruption of the business, of the operations, or only disruption of business? Because insurers, they insist that we are talking about a full stoppage of the, pre pre the premises, of the uh, operations of the insured to trigger the, 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 the indemnity. Notifiable disease clauses are, of course, again, uh, argument, argumental. Uh, the general nature of these clauses is to provide insurance cover for business interruption loss caused by occurrence of a notifiable disease at or within a specified distance or in the vicinity of the policyholder's business premises. So most wordings that I looked into, they use the word vicinity, however, they do not specify it. How much is a vicinity? What is a vicinity? We know it's the adjacent or a surrounding properties, but it's not anywhere in the, in the, in the uh, clauses itself that define what is a vicinity, uh, what, is, what, is, what do you mean by vicinity? So the insurers argue that this, is only, this only covers cases that occurred within the specified radius, and any cases outside that area were not part of the insured peril. Of course, this, this would uh, cause severely, it would severely limit the cover available as it would be extremely, if not difficult, for policyholders to pinpoint the exact location of the, of the cause of the loss, such as they would prove that, the, is, it, is it within the radius or not? It's impossible to prove that. The insured, however, they argue that this clause should be read as covering the business interruption wherever the case occurred, provided there was at least one case within that radius. Now, the test case, the British test case that was uh, made later on, I will speak about it in a, in a second, uh, they took the, uh, the, the insured's argument as the more factual as they should be applied. So, the, the, they took the side of the insureds for, against the insurance. The third is the trends clause. The trends clause, uh, they, are, uh, they are relevant to the calculation of the insurance loss because they take account of the circumstances, trends of the insurance business. Because, you know, this income stream is not stable all over the year. It goes up and down depending on the circumstances or seasonal or whatever. So this type of clause appears in most business interruption policies and allows insurers to reduce the amounts payable under the policy where other wider factors have insufficient, uh, are insufficient or has, it's, have influenced its ability to, to trade. The arguments, the insurers say that trends, the trends clause meant that insurers were not liable to indemnify policyholders for losses that would have arisen as a result of the wider consequence of the pandemic. And they rely on a very famous case, British case, which is the Orient Express, it's an American case actually. The Orient Express hotels very generally. This is a, a case, uh, this is a hotel in, in uh, Louisiana in America. And there was of course the big flooding in 2005, the Katrina and Rita uh, at the time. And the, there was, the, 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 the hotel, they claim for two kinds of uh, claims. One is the denial of access to the hotel itself because you know, guests are not able to get into the hotel. And they claim against the wider area damage, which is, uh, the, the, sorry, the other one is the, for the damage for the hotel itself uh, from the flood. The, in this case, the courts said, no, you cannot really uh, get indemnified because of the wider area damage from the flood, but you can get, you know, c compensation for the denial of access, which was really sublimated and a very close amount. Very, it was very, uh, you know, uh, small amount. The insured relied on other also famous case, which is called the Silver Cloud case, PNC Insurance Limited versus Silver Sea Cruise Limited. This one, 
the, the, the audience expressed this was a material damage, the flood. The silver cloud, this is a different case. This, was a, this is a cruise ship a company. And they claimed, because of the 9-11 uh, cases in America, they said that we have a wide area damage coming from the terrorist attack in 9-11. And also, the government, the US government advisory that people should not travel, should not use uh, cruises. And as such, uh, this case sh should be used as you know, evidence that the cover could be uh, could be triggered. So, as a test, the, uh, in Britain, in England, they went to the courts and they make this mock uh, court case, which was by the Financial Conduct Authority, the FCA, versus Arch and others. And uh, in January 2021, the, of course, it went to the courts, to the higher court, then to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court handed down the, its judgment on the case that the FCA, the Financial Conduct Authority, intended to resolve all the uncertainty as to how business interruption policies would respond to COVID-19 related claims by obtaining a judgment in relation to the meaning and effect of a representative sample of multiple policies. They took 21 wordings and they tested it in courts against eight insurers, representatives, which are Arch Insurance, Agenda, Celestical, Hiscox, His, Amblin, QBE, and uh, RCA at uh, uh, Zurich Insurance. And there were you know, some representative of the uh, policyholder representatives uh, in this case. This uh, we really overturned the table over the insurers. The Supreme Court accepted the FCA agreement and said that the insurers really should pay the claims stemming out from COVID-19. So the impact, if this decision was to be taken, you know, a step further and used in other courts, uh, the losses would be substantial. Premiums already have increased. Capacity is reduced, and we can feel it. And businesses now find it more difficult to obtain cover. Insurers that continue to offer insurance against epidemics and pandemics, business interruption, will likely want to provide precise wording about coverages and to consider an appropriate premium for the coverage. In circumstances where policyholders find that they are not covered as they expected, they will still be looking to recover uh, those losses from elsewhere. In this regard, the impact would be largely felt in the D and O and PI covers that will be discussed later by my colleague here, Christian. Reinsurance-wise, the impact uh, uh, will be, we believe that it will be systematically excluded from the treaties. especially the treaties covering disaster risks. And currently in the EU, there are proposals to create private-public private, private partnership or pools for protection against future, future pandemics and uh, non-damage business interruption. The non-proportional reinsurance, excess of loss, and per event are still, for the time being, are the first solution for, for such coverage for pandemic risks. The interpretation of the inability to use and denial of access in situations where businesses are still able to use part of their premises still have a significant impact on the how claims to be adjusted. And again, we have to revisit the aggregation provisions that are defined by reference to events, occurrences, or catastrophes, uh, especially the CAT excess of loss treaties, uh, need to be revisited with aggregation provisions, they talk about uh, you know, occurrences that happen in a certain place, certain time, in a certain way. So how does this be compared to uh, COVID or to any virus uh, risks? Because risks coming from viruses, they don't come from a one place or at one time or in, a, in any specific situation. So this is kind of has to be revisited and where things has to be again uh, trying to accommodate such uh, new types of risk. 
So what needs to be done? We need to, be, to put more emphasis on the importance of clear and comprehensive policy wording. Students and reinsurers will need to consider the extent to which losses can be recovered under reinsurance contracts, subject always, of course, to uh, disagreements. Things like follow the settlements clause, follow the fortune clause. Uh, these are very disputed uh, clauses in the treaties. Uh, for example, if you take, the, now we know that the COVID-19 overlapped more than one year, and in circumstances where applicable exclusions clause may have been inserted in the renewal, how to deal with that? I finally uh, quote Mr. Dennis Kessler, the CEO uh, of SCORE, and chairman of SCORE, and he says that only the government can cover the cost of economic impact of such a major crisis through redistribution mechanisms that spread the cost over all economic agents and even over several generations. It's not surprising then that to date, no country has managed to develop a system whereby insurance covers this cost. It's not about bad faith on the part of insurers, rather it's a question of technical and economical feasibility. Uh, I've tried uh, in such a short uh, time to try to uh, summarize what happened. So, uh, if you have any questions from me, I don't know if you want to take questions now or later after we finish both sessions. Uh, it's up to you if you have the time. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Basan. So, I suppose there are no questions. So, we can conclude this by saying that insurance is an ocean and uh, gaining knowledge and experience is a matter of time and a uh, lot of heads have come together to draft the policies but as a law suggester I would say like when I encountered the first property or risk policy so I thought it's all risks so but when we went into the wording so it's not covering everything so Mr. Basam has done well and uh, I think you found this very interesting. Of course, it's complicated and it will need a lot of more such sessions. And thank you very much for being patient and attending this. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. First of all, there's a it go. First of all, I would like to thank the Jordan Insurance Federation for inviting me to hit the second session. Uh, the second topic for today is very interesting and a uh, very specialized area, which is the uh, DNO, Directors and Officers Liability, uh, the impact of pandemic, epidemic, and how we can uh, link it to the uh, DNO uh, liability insurance. Our distinguished speaker for today is uh, Mrs. Uh, Christina Shalita, who's going to tell us more about this specialty line of business, D&O. She is the Vice President Head of Facultative at NASCORI, France, and she has a bachelor degree in business administration from the Holy Spirit University of Kaslik in Lebanon. Uh, Mrs. Shalita has been in the reinsurance industry since 1993, and she has an extensive experience in the reinsurance facultative placement, mainly in property and specialty lines such as political violence, cyber, and financial lines. She's very close to the market and organized many workshops for new products in cooperation with the world lead reinsurers, and she runs a team of 35 individuals in a, a three different countries and uh, managing an insurance portfolio of over 400 million US dollar. Please welcome with me Mrs. Sharita. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you everyone for attending this session. Uh, thank you also for the Jordanian Insurance Federation Committee uh, together with the GAIF for organizing this uh, very well uh, and professional sessions. And I'm sure that the Aqaba 2022 will be a successful one, especially after two years of absence due to COVID-19. 
talking about the devil, COVID-19, and this pandemic, and its impact of, on our life, and specifically on the insurance, on this DNO policies, this is our topic of today. This pandemic has definitely changed our life, our behavior, our work habits, disrupted our businesses. This is where a director can become a liable in managing unprecedented challenges in his day-to-day -day duties. And this is how I will demonstrate this in my very successful study. Mind you, I'm not a specialist and writer, so I'm not an expert in DNO that much. It's a very complicated line. We have very various uh, uh, triggers, uh, so I hope you're kind with me. <laughs> and let's start with this presentation by refreshing our knowledge on the DNO cover. So our presentation is in, uh, it will be divided in four sections. The first one, what is the DNO cover? What, what are the, the, the features of the DNO? The second one is the impact of COVID-19 on business operations in general. Then the impact of COVID-19 on DNO policies and some concrete examples. So what is a DNO cover? The di director's and officer's liability insurance protects the personal asset of a company's director and his spouses in the event they are personally sued by any stakeholder. The stakeholder can be a client, that can be an employee, can be a vendor, a competitor, or mainly a shareholders. The, the majority of the claims emanates from shareholders for their actual or alleged wrongful acts in managing the company. Sorry. <laughs> Oops, sorry. <laughs> so, directors can be sued for a variety of reasons. They can be sued for, for example, misrepresentations of companies' assets, misuse of companies' funds, frauds, failure to comply with workload places, etc., etc. Organizations take the no policy primarily to protect three, three main fronts. The personal asset of a director uh, and officers, the company's assets, so income uh, uh, statement and their balances, and the, the cost of reimbursement in case they have to indemnify their directors for any legal cost. So the policy usually has three sides, side A, side B, side C. It's all wrapped in one policy. And each one has its own features and own conditions. So side A is really related to the personal liability of a director and officers. The side B is related to the company's asset. The first, the first side is, is triggered really when the company cannot protect or cannot uh, indemnify their directors. The side B is mainly for companies' assets for, to pay the legal, uh, legal cost for any defense of their directors. Side C is mainly for publicly listed companies, for security claims mainly. Companies can face various exposure, claims by employees. Let's give some examples. Claims by employees. For example, they can claim uh, alleging any harassment, any discrimination, any wrongful terminations. Claims by customers, by clients and consumers. For example, they can you know, uh, uh, sue you for a contract dispute, false advertisement. We'll, we'll talk about this, this uh, in some, some examples. Claims by competitors and suppliers. For example, unfair competition resulting in lost businesses. Claims by other third party. For example, now the ASG is very trendy, you know, environmental reputations, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Claims by shareholders. This is what I saw. I told you. This is the majority of the claims uh, uh, that that are triggered under DNO policy. For example, a breach of duties of their directors in in obtaining their income or uh, materializing a very big uh, account. Uh, breach of duty to to of loyalty. Uh, also, there is a breach of M&As, uh, the confidentiality of the M&As agreement. Now, they are very, you know, uh, uh, trendy, trendy things. 
the common feature of a DNO policy, the coverage is quite, quite broad. It's, of course, as we said, it's the cost of defending legal and regulatory actions. However, DNO can also pay fines and penalties. Exclusions, certain types are, of course, are ex typically excluded, such as deliberate fraud, criminal acts, willful misconduct, or damage for bodily injury and property damage. We can have some first party extensions also, like internal investigations. Uh, you can purchase also additional cover extensions, such as employment practice liability, public relation, or extradition costs. Usually underwriters, they have a very minimal deductibles or zero deductibles. It depends on the uh, wordings and uh, uh, governments. Uh, and there is a loss limit. Uh, the DN also will pay the claim up to this loss limit. You can, of course, you know, uh, purchase additional excess, of, excess uh, of loss covers. It depends on your needs and the market condition. Here we have in this graph the general, the top 10 uh, causes that are uh, triggered under the, the DNO. As you can see, the computer network system uh, error is, num is represent 12% of this, which is, this is, this is a very you know, interesting thing because usually when there is a breach of, uh, of uh, cyber, the first one who is uh, looked at is the senior manager. Because the, you know, the shareholders or their clients, they consider that they failed to prevent a breach of this cyber uh, security. And this, is, and this can lead also to a bankruptcy, bankruptcy or is the reduction of their share price. We have an example. In 2022, Yahoo has settled a, a data breach lawsuit for $80 million because they were sued by their shareholders uh, for their cyber attack, attack and as they couldn't you know, disclose it properly. And this has reduced their share price by 30%. Here we have a, a small graph about the, the impact of COVID-19 on worldwide GDP. As you can see in this graph, the COVID-19 has a severe impact, a negative impact on worldwide GDP. The forecast for 2020 was 2.9%. And unfortunately, due to, to the COVID-19, it has decreased by 3.4% by in view of the slowing down of businesses, various lockdowns, and business interruption. To put this number in perspective, what is the worldwide GDP uh, uh, provision for 2020? It was $84 trillion. Uh, uh, US dollar in 2020. So meaning 3.4% represent around $2.96 trillion of lost economy, which is a huge. However, in view in 2021, as you can see, this went up as 5.6%. This is due to government expander and, uh, and the increase of personal consumption. Then the forecast is in 2022, 4.5% and to reach the normal trend, which is 3.2% in 2023. In this slide, we have a small graph, uh, a comparison between the impact of COVID-19 on businesses and a comparison between the financial crisis 2008-2009. As you can see, it's a very interesting uh, comparison because we all, you know, assimilate the, the COVID-19 to a financial crisis, but it's not a financial crisis. It has a different dynamics. In 2008-2009, as you can see, the number of bankruptcy went as high as 53%, whilst in, in, during the pandemic from 2019 to 2020, there was minus 17 of bankruptcy. This has uh, an explanation by two factors. The first one is the government, uh, multi-phase policies response, and the economic support scheme given to various uh, SMEs and big companies uh, to stay afloat uh, by delaying, for example, tax payment, by reducing uh, you know, uh, the bank loans, uh, uh, several financial aids, and allocation by government specifically for the SMEs. The second one, the second point, was due to the level of, you know, uh, uh, 
the economical you know, strengths of many companies that entered the COVID-19. They were, you know, they were very strongly cash flows, so this has prevented from any, you know, reduction of their, uh, of their income. Let's zoom a little bit on the impact of COVID-19 on some of the lines in the insurance business. To talk about the health, there were concerns that health insurance would experience significant uh, additional payout from an increase of COVID-19 related to hospitalization and treatment. However, uh, many, many experts have realized that this impact was smaller than expected. They attribute this fact mainly to the successful self-isolation uh, at home rather than uh, being hospitalized for, for various uh, individuals. And there has, been also, there has been a decline of the non-COVID claims uh, because of the lockdown. So, you know, uh, all of us stayed home, motor and personal accidents were lower than expected. This has really impacted the health insurance uh, insurers and had, you know, lower, imp uh, lower negative uh, uh, on, their, uh, on their return. The general insurance, however, they have in fact uh, been affected by various waves. Uh, travel, in, travel has been severely dis disrupted, affecting travel policies, of course. Motor claims also has been affected as various lockdown measures have resulted in an unprecedented drop in number of road, uh, road users. Also, theft claim has been very, very uh, decreased in view, again, of lockdowns. Engineering, marine, motor and trade credit, also these are lines that were affected because of the various business interruptions, lockdown, slowdown of, uh, of uh, new projects, etc., etc. Uh, but the surprise is the life pension, where this has resulted in a significant uh, uh, number of premature deaths and the severity of claims uh, combined with lower interest rate, because we all know that the life insurance is assets and they invest their assets. As, the, as there was low, low insurance rate and uh, uh, severity of claim, this has resulted in a very negative way and, uh, their, uh, in their results. Foreseeable losses, uh, DNO losses due to COVID. How can we foresee a loss under DNO? You know, uh, underwriters, when they have a potential global recession plus poten potential bankruptcies, this is where directors become liable because they can uh, uh, trade while they can become insolvent. So trading, uh, here we have this disruption. And so directors become more liable for trading while insolvent. Several governments have realized this. Uh, this uh, challenge and have tried to bring measures to reduce this liability and temporarily relieve directors. However, you know, government cannot subsidize for everything and this is where DNO claims can be triggered m uh, more, more severely. Risk of claims during this pandemic. Organizations around the world have been dealing with a myriad of uh, COVID-19 issues and directors and officers are usually amongst an organization top concerns. In this context, this pandemic, the risks may include, may include misrepresentation of companies' assets, fiduciary duties, you know, breach of fiduciary duties. For example, directors, you know, are not able to perform, you know, their, their duties in order to make the companies profitable. Balancing needs and priorities. Directors, you know, they are faced to challenges. How can they, you know, they need to balance between the needs of, you know, maintaining, you know, the company's income and the, the priority to, you know, protect their, employee, their employees, their colleagues, their clients in a healthy environment. This is a big challenge for many organizations around the world. And this, of course, in case of a breach of any of these priorities or needs, this can lead to a DNO claim. Unanticipated risks in the workplace law. Many governments have, you know, set def different sides, different rules of confinement, of lockdowns, you know, all these, you know, these new measures are unprecedented and directors are not able, you know, to cope with it, especially also that many advisors are, were also, you know, taken by the COVID-19 and were not able to really, you know, assist the companies to take the appropriate measures and uh, advisory. 
A reputational risk. Here also, this is one of the major factors under DNO. You know, directors are always afraid from taking a decision because any decision can impact their, their uh, reputation and then can lead to a, uh, to a claim under the, 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 the DNO. And of course, co compliance and uncertainties. This again, uh, every day we have, we have to face several compliance issues, several uncertainties in regulations. Are we following you know, the regulations properly? Are we doing the right thing? Again, these are main, sub main you know, trigger under uh, a DNO. We have sometimes first party cases over, uh, often overlooked under DNO, especially due to COVID. Of course, all of us during COVID, we had, you know, crisis management meetings in order to decide, you know, what shall we do? How can we, you know, define our business, you know, uh, uh, models? Uh, shall we, uh, you know, maintain the work from home? Shall we, shall we uh, uh, review the, the strategies, etc., etc.? So crisis management is a first party potential uh, claim under DNO. For example, you can have an announcement of negative earning that can also impact, you know, the, the, whole, the shareholders, key executive resignations. We had had several, you know, companies where key executives wanted to do to change their uh, their uh, their work. You know, they wanted to, to do, uh, you know, cooks or <laughs> or uh, gardening or whatever. This has also, you know, uh, impacted a lot the businesses. A product recall because of, you know, uh, a potential uh, COVID uh, contamination. Uh, elimination of suspension of dividend. Also, this is when you announce the suspension of dividend, shareholders can be annoyed and then can sue you. Uh, so uh, all this can be also a first party uh, uh, cases under DNO. Again, we can talk about reputation risk. You know, this has impacted a lot. Uh, the directors and 58% of directors consider that the reputation is a key factor in any of their decision making. Again, did we take the right decision? Can we, you know, uh, uh, not be, you know, sued if we take a decision that impact our businesses, impact our employees, our colleagues, our customers? This is this is where a DNO claim can be triggered. Let's talk a little bit about the underwriting uh, trend during, after, before the COVID and after the COVID. Before the COVID, as we all know, the market was very soft. There was DNO policies taken, abandoned capacities, uh, and everyone was not understanding exactly the impact of the COVID uh, under DNO policies. The, the claims started to, uh, to arise and, uh, of course, the, you know, uh, underwriters started to review their, uh, uh, their wordings, to review their, uh, their underwriting uh, uh, trend, and this is where they started to increase rates and conditions to impose a COVID-19 exclusion and to have more, the proposal to have, uh, to have it more specified and more detailed, uh, especially in relation of any measures taking to, uh, taken to avoid uh, any DNO claims. And the market became ha harder and harder, and there is lack of capacity. Specialists have uh, 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 analyzed that uh, the claims under DNO have fallen into one of the three categories. Companies that experienced coronavirus in their, uh, in, their, uh, in their facilities, like, for example, cruise ship lines, like private systems, uh, prison systems, factories, warehouse, all these companies have fallen under the first one. The second one, companies that hope to profit from the coronavirus uh, outbreak. For example, like pharmaceutical uh, companies, they were hoping to have vaccines, uh, therapeutic uh, 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 systems against COVID and unfortunately they couldn't perform or they didn't get the approval and this is where they can be you know sued for false advertisement or misrepresentation of their uh, of their companies companies whose operations or financial performance were disrupted by the outbreak like airlines like hotels like real estate this is mainly under BI this is what uh, uh, Bassam has, uh, has uh, shown. Uh, BI claim were the most, you know, uh, spread 
under uh, under uh, the normal property or the NO also. I'm going to give you a small a small uh, uh, review of two famous claim, Zoom. We all started to get acquainted with Zoom. We all have, you know, uh, uh, had our hurdles how to open Zoom, how to <laughs> operate Zoom. Unfortunately, Zoom, as early as April 2020, 2020 they had a lawsuit against them by many, many clients because of uh, the, the false advertisement that their, their services was end-to-end -end, uh, encrypted and secured, which was not the case. So uh, the complaint uh, has, uh, has made uh, 15 false and misleading statements uh, alleging that we offer robust, secure, compatible uh, com uh, capabilities, including end-to-end encryption. -end so unfortunately, Zoom was sued up to $85 million uh, uh, a lawsuit in the US. And this example shows how questions about privacy and security issues can lead to a DNO claim. The second example is, again, we spoke about it, is pharmaceutical product. Anarix is one of the more, most known pharmaceutical pro, uh, company in the US. Here also, they have advertised that they are going to have a, a security uh, a respiratory therapy a treatment, which unfortunately was not approved by the FDA. And uh, accordingly, they, they, didn't, they missed the opportunity, and their share price fell down by 25%, and they were sued by their shareholders because they didn't take you know, the, this, uh, the, the approval from FDA. So I gave you a small summary of DNO and its impact on COVID and in general. Is, uh, uh, we conclude that this is a very uh, uh, specialized line. We don't understand it a lot. We try as much as possible to, to protect our companies and directors by taking the, uh, the this cover because this is, a, like you say, it's a company, uh, uh, a balance sheet protections, and the directors needs to be protected nowadays because we are facing more and more unprecedented crises. Now we have another crisis is coming, for example, the war from uh, Russia and Ukraine. This also can lead to a many DNO claims, and this is where the companies should be really aware of the impact of the, uh, the DNO on their companies. Thank you. Does anyone have some questions? Thank you very much for the interesting presentation. <laughs> Actually, before... Uh, we open the floor for the audience. I would like to make a comment uh, regarding the D and O liability insurance. As you're all aware, it's at the end of the day liability insurance, i.e. you need to prove the liability of the policyholder, who is the director or the officer first. You need to file a case as a plaintiff against the director and officer and prove their liability in order for the insurance company to sit in and pay on behalf of uh, the policy. is different from one jurisdiction to another. Uh, what is uh, uh, illegal in certain jurisdiction according to the commercial company's law and or uh, the laws and regulations issued by uh, the regulator might be different from one uh, jurisdiction to uh, another. Another uh, point in, in respect of the uh, COVID claims and uh, the and or liability and how, how it is linked. I see it, it's uh, uh, very remote, for example, to file a claim against the directors and officers of one company uh, claiming that they should have expected uh, the pandemic and they should have taken the necessary measures and procedures and to manage the risk uh, properly in order to mon uh, minimize or uh, avoid su such risk. It is, uh, it is not an uh, easy task. So, um, uh, 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 Christina, are you aware of any such cases filed against the directors and officers whereby uh, the stakeholders, including the shareholders, might claim that uh, 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 your mismanagement, your failure to, uh, to uh, manage the risk properly has resulted in, in a loss uh, to us as, as, as the shareholders? Thank you. As I, uh as I said, you know, as I, uh, you know, many, most of the DNO claims are uh, not in our region. 
you know, most of the RDNO claims are mainly in US and Europe. And, uh, and as, I, as I gave you two examples, you know, the Zoom one, uh, you know, and, uh, and the Yahoo, for example, uh, and this NRX, you know, the most important is to understand that, you know, a director uh, is faced to un unprecedented challenges. So he's, he's, he's there, especially during COVID-19, it's a, it's a pandemic, nobody knows what's gonna happen, what, nobody knows, uh, there's so much uncertainties, and there's the, 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 the government has Im, you know, imposed lockdowns, imposed new measures, uh, and he has to face all this. So he has to understand where, where, is the, where I have to draw a line, and this, this decision, any decision can affect him in, in the course of the business. Now, as I said, the, the famous one is the Zoom, where you know they they were not uh, uh, properly you know prepared for this uh, pandemic, and this is where the shareholders have have uh, sued them. The second one is uh, is, but I don't. Um, we are not very familiar because it's still too early to uh, to to know the impact of COVID-19 under DNO. Especially again, as you said, this is a liability. This is a long tail. And, uh, and now we just started to, you know, really go out from the pandemic and see what is the impact on our businesses and our insurances. Thank you very much. Any question from the audience to any of uh, our two speakers, distinguished speakers? Please. Yes. There's microphone, please, for the... Excuse me. Excuse me. Can you provide microphone for the audience? صباح الخير جميعا أنا الدكتور أسامة نعيمات عميد كلية الحقوق في جامعة فيلادلفيا ومهتم بقطاع التأمين وأيضا لدي لوفر في الخدمات القانون ليجل سيرفيس الحقيقة المداخلة بسيطة فقط في حدود أو في إطار المسؤولية التي تترتب على الإدارة في ظل الجائحة كما تعلمون لا يمكن أن نواجه هذه الجوائح في ظل هذا الظرف الطارئ باستخدام القواعد القانونية العامة السارية التي استقرت في وجدان الجميع مؤمنين ومؤمن لديهم لكن تماشيا مع هذا الظرف اللي هو الاستثنائي اللي هو فورس على اعتبار أنها قوة قاهرة أو ظرف طارئ يتم التعاطي من قبل القضاء مع هذا الموضوع في هذا الإطار ولذلك لا أجد أنه سيحمل المدراء أو مسؤولي قطاع التأمين مسؤوليات أكبر من دونهم أو من غيرهم من القطاعات الأخرى فنحن محكومين بقواعد قانونية عامة عولج هذا الشق منها في إطار القوة القاهرة أو حالة الطوارئ وتبقى المسؤوليات كما هي سارية ولكن يؤخذ بعين الاعتبار بأن هذا ظرف طارئ هذه قوة قاهرة جعلته يقصر رغما عن إرادته شكرا معك حق 100% مشان هيك in my slide number 12 I said that governments have really you know acknowledge that this pandemic is something, you know, exceptional and have tried to relieve the directors from their liabilities. So, but again, you know, they cannot relieve them for a long term. So now we are like at the stage and it depending on the governments also, you know, for various governments have decided different measures, different uh, uh, procedures. Uh, so this is depending, but you're totally right. Uh, you cannot, you know, uh, 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 held responsible any directors for a pandemic for the unprecedented challenges this is this is where you know directors you know uh, have to know where what to do but unfortunately nobody know how to wh how to operate in in this in this chaos okay thank you very much any other question from the audience please are you one yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, Naim from Arab Lost Adjusters. First of all, would like to thank the Insurance um, Federation, Jordan Insurance Federation, for really arranging for this. I think it is international conference. Mm. So um, I congratulate them for their actual efforts. 
Um, secondly, would like to thank Ms. Shalita also for handling this is it's, it's very controversial exactly. the and all policy without pandemic. Mm. So uh, I would like to congratulate thank you, you for your courage of taking this one because thank really you. I mean and I can um, tell you I was like <laughs> I, I was the head of insurance and risk management yeah. for it had yes, yes. it's not an easy subject I, I agree with you and we had a claim for I mean D and O, it was very controversial because it will have overlapping coverage with cyber, so exactly. is it going to fall under the cyber policy? You have also uh, employ employers practice also exactly. extension for the policy. So it is by itself, it without is pandemic, it's already controversial. Complicated. <laughs> so thank You're you totally right, thank you. Handling this one. Secondly, my technical point want to add. <laughs> my colleague here from the, the law, I mean, he's absolutely, he is right, and, and pinpoint exactly uh, where is the uh, legal perspective of this one. But for me, as an insurance expert for this one, and I have some studies on these yes. things, I would, I mean, focus at this stage on the research statistic and how to make a module for insurance because catastrophic also it wasn't covered True. and I think is the um, COVID-19 is pandemic okay so uh, let us I think um, put more efforts technically on how to um, shape the scope of coverage and how to figure the impact of I mean financial aspect of this one plus adding I mean the uh, a cost for employment, cost for margin of exactly. profit, blah, blah. Okay. I do not think now, up to now, we are just only doing narrative only story 100%. for what we are doing. So let us go deeply and try to figure out how we can assess this risk. What is our plan as future professional for this industry and how to move forward with such cases because up to now, okay, you could not have one module for catastrophic on handling um, weather, storm, tempest, okay? You don't have up to now, even with, with the Lloyd Syndicate, with the uh, Munich Re, with, with you respect for all of these, I mean, insurance professional. So I think we have to focus on technicality now to find out the exact score for this coverage and how much is the government can contribute Assist, to this exactly. one and how much the insurance sector should contribute to this one. By the way, we are at Arab Loss Adjusters started insurance club for continuous efforts to bridge the gaps between these things and sometimes up to now we are suffering from traditional business even gaps between theory and different uh, policy wording. So exactly. with pandemic, this one has been aggravated. So at Arab Loss Adjusters, we are trying actually with the help of the insurance community uh, uh, to do some efforts in this regard. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. Thank the you. microphone please to Mr. Joe Azad. You want to speak or to Ziad? Sorry, Mr. Ziad. But I would like to add also, it's all about also awareness. That's very important. We should, you know, be more, give more awareness, you know, do more workshops and to, you know, really invite our clients, you know, our, uh, to, to let them understand the cover and let them know what is the impact of uh, lack of insurance because they always, you know, minimize the insurance. You know, it's the last, you know, uh, expense cost that they will look at. You know, they will look at many others, but accept the insurance. So this, this comes, let's start by this, awareness. Actually, it's the untapped market, yani. if we make a survey. We don't have statistics, region, yeah. exactly. Yeah, Unfortunately, so I tried to get statistics on the region mm. of how many DNO policies and how, uh, how many claims are triggered under DNO in this, uh, in this market, in our region. Unfortunately, there are none. Uh, you know, there are a few bits and pieces, but the, we don't have, you know, official statistics. Okay. Dr. Ziad Najem, yes. please. Yes. Hi, I'm Ziad Najem. We want to thank uh, first Christina for this outstanding presentation. Thank you. It's really uh, very interesting and uh, we loved it. Uh, 
The question next has to be to Raid. To me? Yes. Daura Kalla. I'm in the obsession. I'm just going to tell you. Please go ahead. Shway Alex, Shway Alex. No, it's, 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 uh, I mean, because you said something about uh, judgments. Uh, so the indemnity would be paid upon a final and irrevocable judgment or upon the receipt of the claim. No. And what no, about what about no. as well the lawyer fees? Mm. It would start as well yes. to, to trigger since the claim is submitted yes. or at the end as well when the case would be lost mm. or won. Thank you very much. So sorry, sorry, Raed, but just, no, my it's no, just, I, I'm just commenting on, I'm just commenting on what you said and my it's It's not about, it's about the judgment, not yeah. about the lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so they claim definitely as a liability lines of business will be paid upon a final judgment. Yes. A revocable final judgment issued by the uh, competent uh, court, court. Uh, when it is final. Uh, and in this judgment, it is uh, a proof that uh, the policyholder has been held liable to pay the compensation to the plaintiff. So in this case, the insurance company will step in and will apply the limits, the deductible, etc. Uh, uh, in relation to your second question regarding the legal fees, the legal fees is part of the uh, cover. Are covered, yes. Uh, one of the issues we, we are facing as insurance companies, you know, sometimes we, we are paying legal fees, by the way, more than the claim I itself, itself, because yeah. there is no certain or specific limits only for the legal fees. It is part of the entire it's limit. It's capped up to, to the full limit. And sometimes we're limits. ending up paying legal fees more, more than the claim the, itself. The so claim it itself. is definitely part of, of the claim. The legal fees incurred in relation to def uh, defending the, uh, your legal case. Also, there is another important point. According to the terms and conditions of the policy, the insurance company has the right uh, to take over the defense whether in terms, of course, of the uh, cost or to appoint uh, the lawyer uh, and to represent the policyholder because at the end of the day, uh, the claim will be paid by the insurance, insurance company. company. So it is in the best interest of the insurance company to manage the legal case and to defend it, uh, to cooperate closely if they don't want to appoint their own lawyer, to operate closely with the policyholder and his lawyer, how to defend the case. Okay, thank you. Uh, the 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 DNO cover covers as well the negligence. Yes, it does. Uh, but cover the, the negligence, the but but not the willful misconduct. Exactly, exactly. The negligence uh, is covered under under DNO. Yes. Thank you very much. Negligence, if I may, negligence may be better be covered under PI policies. But yeah, again, no, no, it, it is covered be, under yeah, under DNO. Yes. But uh, uh, is the. Uh, uh, the the, the, the policies, there is always a limit. Uh, Plus limit, yes, okay. up to which so the there is a limit. Is so regardless whatever the, the court uh, did rule, there is a limit on the policy. So usually this is a lower limit than... Uh, you know, usually the usually they take $5 million or $10 million, yeah. etc. It depends on the, on the company's, you know, uh, uh, strengths, you know, or yeah. needs. Yeah. But uh, yes, negligence Please is definitely over, covered. Over there. Yeah. yeah. Trust Iraq. Trust us, Iraq. Uh, just a question. I mean, by tackling this issue, uh, is it easy to underwrite this kind of account, bearing in mind that it will be reinsured in a regulated market? I mean, insurance companies, can they insure directors and officers, regardless of the standards? before going to the liabilities and the uh, consequences. I, I, is there, yeah, I, I mean, you mentioned in directors and officers, uh, yes, I there mean, is rarely few policies in the region, not in a country. Uh, so are they easy to produce? To produce? They said, because this is the starting point. Thank you. No. So, sorry, can you repeat Mas your question, can please? Can you repeat? Yeah. Because uh, I, I didn't about, get the point exactly. Yeah, we're talking about consequences of directors or officers. Yes, yes, the yeah. DNO is to cover the personal... Yeah, but I'm talking you know, about the product itself. The product itself. Yes. There, are, there are certain requirements which has to be submitted before issuing the policy for such a liability insurance. Yes. Am, am I right or not? I mean, it depends on the... Well, what are those re uh, requirements? You mean regulatory approved, requirements? Approved approval? Wording. Regulatory approved and also wording. the underwriter, the reinsurance underwriter. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Will he accept the uh, uh, 
standards or for for issuing such a policy. Usually, I mean, uh, all the regulatory. I mean, as uh, Nasco, for your experience. Yes, how yes. I mean, in the whole region that we operate, I mean, in the GCC and the Middle East, you know, all the DNO policy are approved by regulators. So they are simple policies. Yes, and they are uh, they are being, you know, p p marketed uh, by several underwriters. Now, uh, again, uh, all depends on the on the regulatory uh, regulation, but uh, most of them are approved. Even in Saudi Arabia, I think it is approved. So. Uh, I don't think that there is an issue in our region. Any other question? There, please. Of course, uh, we would like to remind everyone if you would like also to ask for the first session because we postpone the questions at the end of the session. So it's not only to Christina. It's not only Christina. To, to, to <laughs> يعطيكم العافية شكرا على جهودكم استمتعنا في الكونفرنس بالسيشن عندي سؤال على موضوع دي اند او بخصوص مثلا التيروريزم ايليمنت مثلا بتعرفوا البنك العربي قبل كم سنة صار عنده قضية وارتفع عليه قضية في امريكا على اساس داعم عند الارهاب نتيجة قرارات اتخذت بفتح حسابات لناس منتمين لجهات معينة مثل حماس او غيرهم هل الوثيقة الدي اند او والتريجر بهذا الحكي مع انه هم ذي ديد ذا ريزونبل كير لما فتحوا هاي الحسابات بس مع الاسف اخذوا اللو سوت وهلا بنوك اخرى بالاردن مثلا عندها هاي الكيسز فكيف وثائق الدي اند او بتتعامل مع هيك امور yes. مع انهم اخذوا الريزونبل كير هم لما فتحوا الحسابات بس اخذ اجى عليهم لو سوت برا والجورستكشن تاع الدي اند او بتكون وورد وايد مفروض exactly. Exactly. Uh, thank you, Jamal. Definitely, you know, if, the, if a negligence or a lack of respect of corporate governance, governance is, is proven, this can be triggered under DNO if a terrorism attack, if the, if the directors didn't take the sufficient uh, uh, measures to protect their companies and they are sued for terrorism, and it proven that they they uh, they didn't respect the the government the compliance or uh, or the corporate governments yes it can be sued under the you know, i mean uh, my but yani hala mathalan we also have a sanction clause uh, hey, exclusion sanction, hey. so this but might also be applicable like ah. yes ma huwa it is also related terrorism um, sanctioned uh, it means that this entity will be sanctioned whether it is for money laundering for hey. uh, uh, or, or in relation to terrorism. And if, so if a company today, for example, uh, uh, deals with a sanctioned uh, uh, company entity or a client, and uh, they are, for example, uh, they are fined, the directors, the shareholders, can sue the company because they didn't follow the the check the 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 compliance and to make sure that uh, this uh, this entity is sanctioned. Yes, they can be sued to the directors. هلا هم البنك مثلاً عمل الريزنبل كير وما كانش مبين معه إنه this money was channeled through ten bodies to reach مثلاً terrorist organization. فهو عمل دوره البنك بس للأسف إجا عليه حكم وهو ما كانش فعلياً مذنب بس اضطر يدفع. It's it's very tricky. It's very tricky. It's you have to prove the good faith first. It goes without saying, but definitely. I think it can be sued under DNO, yes. Thank you. As you said, uh, Christina, and by, this is a legal liability. It's I mean, if they, exactly. go, if they went to the courts and the court said that you're liable, then you're liable They're regardless liable. of the exactly. whatever you think that you did, uh, you due diligence. This yes, is, it's, it's, it's a liability. liability. Uh, all liability, liability has a long liability. tail, as we all know, and all they have, you know, it can... T it can be on, in court case for re, for years sometimes, you know, because everyone has uh, has a. Would the D and O policy contribute if there is a final uh, law court uh, decision contribute to this claim? Of course. Uh, yes, if they have a D and O policy. Now we, uh, we, the issue is that many they don't buy D and O policies. 
Unless there is an explicit exclusion, the Most policy will eh. respond. But as long as it is general, you know, a broad cover of DNO, yes, they can be, definitely. This is why we, we, we uh, push, you know, to have all the financial institutions to buy DNO because, the, the, you know, their trading in itself is, is very exposed to DNO claims. And also companies, you know, everyone in, in Europe, it's compulsory now to have a DNO and PI policy to trade because, uh, you know, directors are very vulnerable in, in these situations. And uh, it's, they are easily sued. In our world, thanks God, we are not that much, you know, uh, we don't go to legal cases, we just say it's uh, the God's will. But <laughs> I think we are heading towards uh, more and more litigious claims uh, under PI or under, uh, or under DNO policies. Thank you. Question, the, the problem Zama. that we are facing nowadays is the capacity. This is what, which yes, there is, there the is lack of capacity. Extreme yes. lack of capacities and the, the premiums for the and now is are extremely high. Yes, this is what I said. The, this the, is a big the issue. underwriting, uh, you know, now it's a, it's, a, it's a very hard market. There is a lack of capacity for DNO, and we are struggling. And also the information uh, that are needed, uh, they are asking more and more information to understand how the companies are coping with challenges under DNO. And this is, uh, this is becoming, you know, sort of uh, 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 prerequisite before assessing uh, 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 an, uh, an account. I think one of the questions was related to the capacities. Yes. The he was asking whether it's uh, yes. available locally. There is, a v there is a lack of capacity nowadays for DNO policies in the market because of the claims and because of, you know, uh, the uncertainty of, of, uh, of uh, uh, the directors where they are heading, you know. Nobody knows what he is deciding every day. شكرا اعتذر للمرة الأخرى لي لكن يمكن شوي مهمة المداخلة. هذا النوع من البوليسة الأصل أن يدرس وأن توضع له أحكام خاصة تختلف عن القواعد العامة الحاكمة في هذا النوع على اعتبار أن أنت اليوم عم تعمل تأمين على تصرفات تصرفات الفيرست الصف الأول في إدارة أي 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 مشروع لكن الأمر الأهم أيضا أن يحدد ذلك الخطأ ونفرق بين الخطأ العادي والخطأ الجسيم هل نغطي الجسيم أم يغطى العادي والتفرقة بينهم هذه تحتاج إلى معايير يجب أن تفصل بالبوليسة إذا رحنا للقضاء لأنه حندخل في متاهة حنروح للقواعد العامة وهذا لربما يضر بشركات التأمين أو الشركات المؤمنة الأمر الآخر ليحسم النزاع والنظر فيه لجهة التحكيم الذهاب إلى التحكيم فيصل يخفف من حدة اللجوء إلى القضاء وإحكام القواعد العامة عليه فاللجوء لربما بعض الدول تعتبر عقد إذعان وبالتالي يمكن اللجوء إلى القضاء الوطني لكن في أوروبا وفي غيره الوضع مختلف التحكيم فيصل فالتحكيم عندما تكون هناك نخبة هيئة تحكيم متخصصة في التأمين ستتفهم واقع هذه الشروط الموجودة بالوليسة شكرا صح بس تعقيب إذا سمحت فيما يتعلق بالتحكيم إحنا هون نتحدث عن بوليصة بكون اللي بطالب بالتعويض هو المتضرر هو مش طرف في عقد التأمين وبالتالي ما بكون شرط التحكيم يطبق عليه شرط التحكيم هو الذي يطبق بين شركة التأمين وبين المؤمن له الطرفين وقعوا العقد واتفقوا على أنه إحالة أي نزاع قد ينشأ عن الوثيقة إلى التحكيم في موضوع الدي اند او في له هون خاصيه لانه في عندنا كليم احنا مطالبه دعوه قضائيه بتم رفعها من ثيرد بارتي شخص ما له علاقه بوثيقه التامين وبننتظر قرار المحكمه هل سوف يدان هل سوف يحكم على المجلس الاداره عضو مجلس الاداره او الاداره التنفيذيه وبعد ذلك بنتحدث عن وثيقه التامين هلا في حال وقع النزاع بعد قرار الحكم بين شركة التأمين والمؤمن له أنه هل هو مغطى غير مغطى استنادا للوثيقة نعم هون ممكن بعيدك أنه نلجأ للتحكيم صحيح تفضل um, William Consul from MetLife My question is going to be between you and I think the central bank Is there a need for a new or a frame regulations from the new regulator in Jordan in term of D and O or the PI يعني because again I don't believe there is uh, 
a huge market for for especially D and O for the reasons you have mentioned. Uh, but is there a need for for such regulation just to be uh, aware uh, and are ready for any for any cases that might? Because I was discussing with Mr. Ahmed Abu Saud, our head of legal at MetLife, and he said that we usually rely on the international laws. There is no local laws for such uh, cases. So do you think it might be a good for... Uh, yes, I think yes, definitely. But the issue is that <laughs> who's going who's yeah, to... Again, the second question is going to be who's going to lead this. Yeah, is exactly. it, it's going to be uh, <laughs> the central bank who should this is start exactly this initiative? This I replied to you, who's going to lead it and, and how to assess it and how to define. Again, as you said, the no policies are here to protect the company's asset, the directors of the company, because the company cannot survive without, without its directors. So if the director is sued, uh, there is a, you know, a misfunctioning in the company. So uh, this is a protection for the income and the balance sheet of the, of the organization. And we are all fragile. In the, in the area, we are becoming more and more fragile. So we need to protect. But who's going to assess? As you said, I think awareness and sessions like this should be more and more uh, 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 presented by various stakeholders in the insurance market and pushed towards the um, central bank or the regulatory uh, bodies all, all across the region to, to start probably not impose uh, or, uh, you know, as a, as, a, as a compliance. I don't know. Uh, I but think they we, should really we find a new... Uh, like a session for the Jordan Federation and the Central Bank in the coming exactly. years, I think. Okay, Inshallah. thank exactly. you. Inshallah. Thank you. Uh, Christina, uh, I would like to ask a question. Uh, one, of, <laughs> one of your <laughs> slides, you mentioned that 5% out of the claims are coming from uh, fraud. Uh, we know for a fact that only fraud or an intentional malicious act is excluded. Do you mean that if claims have been filed but it is not paid or... Um, um, what is the uh, yes, status? I mean, Five percent coming from fraud. Yeah, it's it's like it's. In fact, uh, how how can you, for example, the company is sued because they didn't really uh, take appropriate measures for the fraudulent fraudulent person. Uh, I see, but it is not resulted from fraud no, per se exactly, as, as a claim. Exactly. Yeah, this is now so, clear. Okay. Yes, yes. yes. No, uh, measures, in order to prevent and to minimize prevent the risk of fraud. Of fraud, okay, exactly. Clear. Yeah, and okay. For example, to give you an idea, uh, uh, a director who didn't take any vacation mm. for years and years and years, and he kept, for example, this can fall under PI or DNO, so it depends. Mm. Uh, and nobody knows what he's doing, so he's like, you know, uh, uh, very, you know, conservative in his work, he doesn't yes. share the information. Here, mm. If there is a fraud and uh, the company can be sued under DNO because they didn't really realize that this person is not really uh, uh, doing his job properly yeah. because there was no much, no such controls or there was no delegation of his work, etc. So you it's the much. cause of Clear. the, yeah. you know. Any okay. other question for the two distinguished speakers before we close the session for today? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very you. much. Thank you. 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 Shukran Lisayed Basim Hadadin, Sayed Manzur Andrabi, Mrs. Christina Shalita, Sayed Raid Khalil Hadadin, Atikum Alf Afia, Ismahuli El An, Min Sayed Jo Azar, and we'd fadal la ilki kilmito kono a sharik il platini bi المؤتمر الرئيس التنفيذي ورئيس مجلس الإدارة لشركة ناسكوري فرانس. Mr. Joe Azar. Fadal. Ahlan wa sahlan. Ahlan bi jami' al-hudur. Ahlan bil asdiqa al-aza. Ma andi khitab tawil, kilme mukhtasara. Bi ismi u bi ism zumalai'i bi majmu'at nasku. Brahib fikum jami'an. U bishkirkun ala wujudkun ma'na al-yawm. بعد غياب طويل رجعنا الحمد لله نلتقى كلنا اشتقنا لجمعة حلوة مثل جمعة اليوم مع الكورونا مثل ما كانوا عم بيقولوا 
غيرنا بنمط حياتنا اليومية واعتمدنا بشكل قوي التواصل الإلكتروني ورح نضلنا نعتمده بس ما في يغنينا عن التواصل البشري ونحن بناسكو دايما شجعنا التلاقي وشجعنا اللقاءات وهذا الشيء رح يستمر بغتنم الفرصة لتوجيه كلمة شكر للاتحاد العام العربي والأمين العام وأكيد شكر خاص للاتحاد الأردني للتأمين ورئيسه الأستاذ ماجد سميرات وأعضاء الاتحاد والأمين العام وبشكرهم لجهود جبارة بتنظيم هالمؤتمر يلي بيعتبر من المؤتمر من المؤتمرات المميزة الحقيقة نتمنى لهالمؤتمر دايما النجاح والحقيقة مؤتمر بضبطه الثامنة لما بيجمع وبيستقطب عدد الحضور بناهز ال 750 ما فينا نقول غير انه مؤتمر ناجح نتمنى لكل المؤتمرات العربية النجاح الدائم اتوجه كمان كلمة تقدير وامتنان لجميع اخواننا بالسوق الاردني لاستضافتهم المؤتمر بهالموقع الجميل من الاردن الحبيب اهل المملكة عودونا دايما على الكرم وعلى حسن الضيافة ولابد من التنويه للعلاقة يلي بتجمع ناسكو بالسوق الاردني وروابط روابطنا المتينة حقيقة هالعلاقة بترجع لاكثر من 40 سنة اول زيارة لإلي زيارة عمل للسوق الاردني كانت بسنة 1978 1978 بقى فينا تكون تعده سنين هالعلاقة الحقيقة تتميز بتعاون ناجح ومثمر ونعتز فيها لهالعلاقة ونفتخر فيها مثل ما بنفتخر بعلاقتنا بكل الاخوان وكل الشركاء بالاقطار العربية والاسواق العربية كيفة تبقى الأسواق العربية بالمحطة الأولى من اهتماماتنا إذا بتسمحوا لي بكلمة بس in English It's great to see so many of you attending this conference and thank you for honoring us with your presence I wish you very fruitful interaction and useful discussion so when we go back home We would have enough food for thought to know what are the best options to cope with the challenges of today's industry. As far as NASCO is concerned, we are accelerating today our transformation and digitalization. We are also focused on something more trendy, which is environmental, social and governance for the purpose of better sustainability. On the ground, we are moving increasingly towards more proximity and moving our teams close to the core markets where we are. Inshallah, Ariban, we are thinking of starting an office, we are planning to start an office in Egypt coming. I think by moving closer to our core markets and to our clients, this confirms very clearly our commitment to the Arab industry we are very happy and delighted to maintain our leading position in these markets in the MENA region. And this is thanks to the trust and confidence of our client base and our partners. Thank you very much from the heart for your constant support. شكرا لكم شكرا يتفضل مستر جو عازر يس والهيد اوف سيشنز بليز والسبيكرز بس انه في صوره لكم 
وقبل بس قبل الصورة سيد عماد الحج نائب رئيس الاتحاد الأردني لشركات التأمين حابب أنه يكرم سيد جو عازر رئيس التنفيذ ورئيس مجلس إدارة شركة ناسكو بالإضافة لتكريم السيد عماد للسبيكرز والهيد اوف سيشنز يعطيك ألف عافية أوكي شكرا ثانك يو مسز كريستينا شليطة ثانك يو مستر منظور أندرابي مستر باسم حدادين and مستر رائد خليل مستر رائد خليل حدادين شكرا لكم تفضلوا على الاستراحة على الكوفي بريك ونرجع نلتقي على 12.30 على 12.30 شكرا لكم